Good morning, and welcome to our virtual worship webcast sponsored by Trinity Moravian Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Of course, we always extend a special welcome to our members and friends, but also to those who are joining us for the first time through the internet. Please take a moment to share a little information about yourself so that we can stay in touch and let you know about other online or in-person events. All you have to do is text the word online to 336-360-0070. Also, please let us know you're online watching. If you're watching on Facebook, post a comment. Let us know you're watching and with us. We welcome your reactions and your thoughts. We also encourage everyone to download the worship materials, the hymns and liturgy in advance from our website or our Facebook group. But based on the feedback we've had, we will be providing everything on screen to make sure you can participate fully. Today's a special day. It is World Communion Sunday, the first Sunday in October, a time when many denominations all around the world share together in a common service of Holy Communion. As we all gather at the Lord's table, we set aside minor doctrinal differences and the differences in practice to emphasize the fact that we are truly all one church together in Jesus Christ. So we'll begin our worship together with hymn number 401, Heart with Loving Hearts United. This hymn was written by Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf in 1723, when he was only 23 years old. It expresses his vision of a church that is one in Christ and one in love, a perfect message for World Communion Sunday. Moravian Church is a liturgical church, which means that we follow the traditional church year and base our worship on liturgies, which are biblically based responsive prayers that involve the entire congregation in both prayer and song. The term liturgy comes from a Latin term that means the work of the people. So even if we can't be together in the same room, we can still join together in the same prayers. So we hope that you will participate fully in praying the Liturgy of Christian Unity, which you'll find on page 122 of the Moravian Book of Worship. 
Almighty God, you're the one who called this universe into being. Out of nothing, you created everything that is. By your power, you hold together all space and time and substance. By your hand alone, Creator God, the inanimate elements became alive so that we could live and move and have our being. We celebrate life, the precious life you have given us, and we celebrate that unity of mind and emotions, of body and soul, that you want us to enjoy and share with each other. We rejoice in the centrality of Jesus Christ in all your works, for he was with you from the very beginning and is supreme over all creation. We praise you that Christ is before all things, and that in him all things hold together, especially our very fragile, vulnerable, and often broken lives. than the whole persons you have called us to be in Christ Jesus until we acknowledge our sins to you. And so we bow before you and pray. Almighty God, we confess that we have tried to run away and hide from you. We constantly deceive ourselves into taking the thing we live without you. We have made idols of our own achievements. We have treated other persons as though they did not bear your image. We have failed to fold and include all persons within the outstretched and open arms of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we have left undone those deeds of loving kindness and godly justice that you want us to pursue in your name. Bring your spirit upon us in a gracious, feeling way. Make us agents of reconciliation as we live within your holy presence. Amen. We thank you, gracious God, for establishing the church as a single body of interdependent members, each having a place and purpose. We know that we need each other and are called to appreciate the great variety of gifts you have given us to use. Help us to rejoice with those who are feeling joy and delight. Help us to sing with those who are singing your love and praise. Help us to taste the agony of those who are hurting. Help us to share the burden of those who are in distress. Take away jealousy and resentment from our hearts when we see others achieving success. Fill us with that spirit of unity in Christ that lets us see and feel and know that we are all to you through the grace we have received. 
Teach us to know and love the worldwide church, called out of all peoples and nations. Make visible the unity that you desire as we express a spirit of reconciliation in all our relationships. Show us that we are part of the one and only body of Jesus Christ, unified by faith, scattered for witness and service. Lead us to appreciate the richness of our diversity and your creative power at work in our various traditions and customs. Make us all one with you by the inspiration and guidance of your spirit. Lead us into lives worthy of our calling in Christ, with our lowliness, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another in love, and eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We pray for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us hear the watchword for the day and reflect upon it. From Psalm 118, the 22nd and 23rd verses. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Let us pray together for the grace that we need, saying, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Dear God, as we, your people, gather in every time and place around this wondrous earth, may we be strengthened by our awareness of one another and united by our mutual prayers. May the variety of traditions and customs of your whole church become a multitude of lights to reveal the good news needed by people everywhere. May the variety of our ministries and service convey your redemptive love and bind us ever closer to one another. Grant us grace to unite the essentials, to accept diversity in non essentials, and to love one another in all things. turn now to our scripture lessons for today, the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. The Old Testament scripture is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you 
what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The Psalm is Psalm 80, verses seven through 15. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it and all that moves in the field feeds on it. Turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted. And the epistle lesson is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. During our in-person services, we always have time for a children's chat when the children come down front and we talk together about the Bible story of the day. Obviously, we can't do that with everyone at home, so I have a Zoom meeting with some of the kids every week so that we can catch up on what they've been doing and also talk about the lesson for the day. We share a portion of that session recorded earlier with you now. Yes, there you are. Yeah, oh, do you see my... <laughs> can I show you a present I got? Yeah, and... what did you get? Yeah. Really? Oh, wow. Look how tiny she is. Her, name, her name is Tilly. Tilly, that's a good yeah, name. I love the show called Big City Green, but that is normally Tilly. She's a beagle? Yep. Yeah, I had a beagle when I was young. They're good dogs. <laughs> Hello, Tilly. Oh, well, that's pretty neat. Sammy, what was it like to get all your hair cut off? It was pretty cool. I actually look good. I think I look good. Yeah, I think I, we have too. four dogs now. You have four dogs. So, Sammy, how long did it take him to do the haircut? Like, it only took him about a minute, two minutes. Oh, no, so he, he, he no, just, it took like ten minutes. Uh huh. Yeah. So they just take the take the cutter and zoom, zoom, zoom. Yeah. Yeah. But you first have to put in, like ponytails, so they like can strip it off. Right. Right. 
they do they do anything with the hair? Do they do they use it for cancer victims? I know some. Yeah, people. yeah for kid cancer. Did, Sammy, did, Sammy had just enough to donate to cancer. Yeah. About two. I asked, yeah, I about did. six inches. I uh -huh. had I about had two thousand dollars. Oh wow, that's yeah. amazing. No, he had twenty one hundred. He had twenty one hundred fifty. Well, that's amazing. That's a really good fundraising thing that you did. My daughter has donated her hair for cancer kids, kids with cancer, several times. Uh, but I don't, I don't have enough to donate. <laughs> Maybe I have enough beard hair to donate. I don't know. <laughs> Hold on. So you showed me your uh, your dog. Uh -huh. So here's this is Missy. This is Missy. She's a tuxedo cat. That's and, so Missy. Yeah. Missy. Yeah, but she she likes it when I do a Zoom because she knows she can get in the chair behind me and make me better. <laughs> yeah, so I have a couple. I've got some show and tell today. Uh, tomorrow is World Communion Sunday. What does that mean? Well, here's the whole world, right? Or here's yeah. a globe. It's not really the whole world. But tomorrow, Christians all around the world set aside a day to have communion uh, with each other to symbolize that we're all one in Jesus Christ and we're so, all brothers and sisters. So, so we need to get grape juice and um, grape juice and bread. <laughs> yep, that's right. And, and then, but then people all over the world do this on the same day on purpose just to say we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. So it's a really important day in a lot of ways and you can think about how you know somebody in china has done has had communion and somebody in africa has had communion and we're having communion tomorrow and so that's a, a neat thing to do together but this year this year it's kind of weird because most of us can't be in the same room together because of covid right so we have uh and that's true in all countries. Every COVID's everywhere right now. So a lot of Christians are doing the same thing that we are. We're at home and we're going to celebrate communion with each other at home. But we can know in our minds that we're celebrating with all these other people who are doing it at the same time. So that's kind of exciting that we can be doing this together even though we're apart, right? So yeah, you think I about that tomorrow. I don't know. Did it? Did you guys hear any good jokes lately? Um. No. Oh, what's a skeleton's favorite um instrument? What's a skeleton's favorite instrument? I don't know what. A trombone. Bone. A trombone. trombone. Oh, I get it. Oh. <laughs> All right, that's pretty good. A trombone. <laughs> All right. Well, good to see you guys. And I'm glad you could be with me, even though that nobody else was able to yeah. be on today. And it's really good to see you all bald there. You did a good job with that. <laughs>
in different areas. We'll turn now to our gospel lesson for today, which is from Matthew 21, verses 33 through 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, Look, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do with those tenants? They all said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone upon whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because the crowds regarded him as a prophet. 
Here ends the reading of our gospel lesson, and may God add his richest blessings to this reading of his word. So today is World Communion Sunday, which has long been an important day for Moravians to take part in because it expresses our historic belief that the Church of Jesus Christ is one. This attitude goes back much farther than the tradition of observing World Communion, which used to be called Worldwide Communion, by the way. It happens on the first Sunday of October every year, but our tradition reaches back all the way to Jan Hus, who wrote in his work, De Ecclesia, The Church, that the true Church of Christ was one throughout the world and happened wherever two or three gathered truly in the name of Christ. He argued that it was not the Pope that was the bond of Christian unity, but Christ himself. He wrote this long before there was even such a word as Protestant, in a time when the Orthodox and Catholic churches had split and the Catholic Church itself was split in half, following two different competing popes. The earliest Moravians held this to be a central principle and decided to focus not on the minor differences that drove denominations apart, but upon the common essentials that we all share together. Count Zinzendorf later was a great proponent of this idea, Indeed, in his concept, the Moravian Church was not a denomination at all, but a renewal society that would call all Christians together in shared mission. In a time of rigid divisions, he befriended the Catholic Archbishop of Paris, leaders of the Anglican Church, and Jewish leaders trying to find common ground to work together. The actual idea for World Communion Sunday came from one man, a Presbyterian minister, named Hugh Thompson Kerr, who was the senior pastor at the Shadyside Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. According to the church historian at Shadyside, David S. Bell, Dr. Kerr first conceived of the notion of World Communion Sunday during his year as moderator of the Presbyterian General Assembly in 1930. It took a couple years to put it into effect. Dr. Kerr's younger son, the Reverend Dr. Donald Craig Kerr, who's pastor emeritus at Roland Park Presbyterian Church in Baltimore, was 16 the first year that this happened in 1933. And he remembers that first Worldwide Communion Sunday vividly. So it's kind of interesting to note that the first Worldwide Communion Sunday was held in just one church in 1933. That's always seemed to me to be an example of optimism and determination. It sounds a little bit like the crazy little churches that will have a ramshackle cinder block building off the beaten path and maybe 25 or 30 members, but they declare themselves to be the Jehovah International Outreach Center. But Carr didn't stop with that one service. He evangelized other Presbyterian churches to join in. And in 1936, the practice was adopted by all Presbyterian churches. And then what was called the Federal Council of Churches, which would later become the National Council of Churches of Christ, and which the Moravian Church was a founding member, adopted the practice in 1940, as World War II was getting underway. Moravians have participated every year since that time. I always get a kick out of telling the story of World Communion Sunday starting at Shadyside because here we are celebrating it on Sunnyside. But the important thing about World Communion Sunday is what binds us all together. It is Christ himself, the Son of God, the one who has saved each one of us that is our common ground. We may speak different languages and sing different songs and dress differently and even celebrate communion differently. But ultimately, we are all bound together by one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I remember one church I was at, we had the elders take turns reading scripture. Now, you may know or may have experienced for yourself that for many people, Public speaking is the most terrifying fear, worse than root canals or snakes. 
We had a lady one year on the elders who was so terrified of public speaking that she almost did not agree to run for the office because she knew that she'd have to read scriptures. But she decided to do it. And the first Sunday she read, at first her voice shook. She stumbled on the words. She was terrified. And it was very evident. Everyone felt awful for her. They were rooting for her. But then, about halfway through the psalm, she seemed to calm down and began to read with a steady voice. The epistle lesson was perfect. After the service, I asked her how she felt and how she had managed to focus so well. Well, to set the, the stage, at the rear of the sanctuary, there was a huge stained glass window of Christ as the shepherd. And while she was reading, she found that if she looked at Jesus instead of the congregation, her heart stopped beating so fast and she could calm down and focus on what she was doing. So every time after that, when she had to read, she would look to the Savior. Like the old hymn has it, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of the world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. When we slip up and take our eyes off of Christ, when we begin to focus on the petty differences, on the personal preferences, on the tiny details, then the church becomes a place divided, little individual boats floating off course in many different directions. It's only when we keep our eyes fixed upon Christ that we can become the one true church of Jesus Christ. When we focus on what is most important, it resets our priorities. That was what Paul was talking about in the epistle lesson this morning. I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Now, let me take a little side trip into Greek for a minute here. You know, when you are learning another language, no matter how you do it, if you're learning French in high school or Latin or Greek or Italian or whatever, one of the things that happens pretty soon, maybe not in class, is you learn all the bad words. I mean, everybody does it. And I did that, too, when I was studying Greek. This passage has a little surprise in it that's cleaned up for church use. The word that he uses in this passage when he says, I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, the Greek word is skubalon, which is in Greek the ill-mannered street term for awful or poop. The translators clean it up because they know we're going to read it in church and somebody might get upset if we said it as bluntly as Paul actually did. I regard them all as <clears throat> in order that I may gain Christ. But this gives us an idea how seriously he took this. All the advantages in his life were nothing but in comparison with the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Christ is what binds us together, what makes us one. As we prepare to gather around the table of the Lord, let us be conscious that we are not just doing this here at Sunnyside or in our homes, but we are joining with Christians all around the world in this symbolic joining of hands. All parts of the church are built together on one foundation, that of Jesus Christ. So, let us prepare for Holy Communion by singing together that great hymn, Hymn number 511 in the Moravian Book of Worship, The Church's One Foundation. 
This hymn was written in 1866 by an Anglican clergyman, Samuel John Stone, who was pastor of a church in East London. Pastor Stone wanted to help his less educated parishioners understand the meaning of the Apostles' Creed, and he could think of no better way to do it than to turn it into a hymn. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. By your divine presence, by the holy sacraments, by all the merits of your life, sufferings, death, and resurrection. Bless and comfort us, gracious Lord God. Amen. In the same way, after supper, our Lord Jesus Christ took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ, the Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. Amen. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death.
our Lamb is still conquering. Let us follow you. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Please take a moment to share a little information about yourself so that we can stay in touch and let you know about other online or in-person events. Just text the word online to 336-360-0070. It's easy to unsubscribe if you're not interested anymore, but it's a great way to know about upcoming events. Just a reminder, for our local folks, we do not currently have anyone in the church office for regular office hours. So please contact me directly, either by phone or email, to make an appointment if you need one. We're sad to announce that our sister in Christ, Nancy Foster, passed into the more immediate presence of the Savior on October 1st. Her funeral will be tomorrow, Monday, October 5th, at 2 p.m. in God's Acre. Visitation with the family will be 12.30 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. at Salem Funeral Home. Please keep the family in your prayers at this time. Fortunately, since the state is now entering phase three and the rate of hospitalizations here in Forsyth County is beginning to stabilize, we can begin to carefully have some in-person meetings and events. We will continue to worship Sundays virtually, and even when we have an in-person gathering, we'll try to make a webcast available for those at high risk who cannot leave at home. We don't want you to be left out. The next in-person event is this afternoon. We'll hold our annual Blessing of the Animals service this afternoon, October 4th at 3 p.m. Since this service is always out on the lawn and always socially distanced to keep the cats and dogs apart, we felt it was a natural for our next gathering during COVID tide. Please let folks know they will be welcome to bring their furry, feathery, or scaly friends to this service, which we hold each year on St. Francis Feast Day to honor the relationship we have with our animals. Later this month, we'll be sending a newsletter to all members with planning information for how we will handle our annual church council, ways we can help the hungry during Thanksgiving, and planning ahead for Christmas. And please check our website or our Facebook group for the most updated information on all these events. Mm -hmm. 